How's everybody doing? Good? Yeah? Okay. So today I wanted to talk about something. Something not very pleasant. Today I wanted to talk about sin. And I had some questions for you. Do you guys know who has sin? Who has sin? Can you tell me? Just us? Do you think everybody out there has sin? They do? What about the people that aren't here? Do they have sin? Yes. What about the people in Alaska? Yes. China? Yes. Africa? Yes. <laughs> so, who's that? Jesus. You're absolutely right. There's only one person that ever didn't have sin, and that was Jesus, because everybody's got sin, all right? Well, if everybody has sin, what is it? What is sin? What do you think? Oh, that's a very good way to put it, when we disobey God, because sin is actually anything that we do that God doesn't want us to do. So that could be something like lying, or stealing, or it can even be things, not just things that we do that God doesn't want us to, but it can also be things that God wants us to do that we don't, because that would be like what you were saying, right? Disobeying God. And going against him because he's so perfect and so holy and so righteous. And so anything that's out of his will is wrong, right? Because he's so right and he's so truthful and righteous, right? Well, there's something else about sin. So what's the big deal about sin? If we all got it and it's disobeying God and it's being out of his will, why is sin a problem? Do you know what's so bad about it? Let me read you a verse. Hold on, I want to read you a verse, okay? And I can tell you exactly why, okay? And it's out of Isaiah 59, verse 2. And I want you guys to listen to this, okay? It says, but your iniquities, iniquities is another word for sin. So, but your sin has separated you between your God. And that's the bad thing about sin, is that sin separates us from God. Because God is so holy and righteous and truthful and wonderful and good and loving that sin, anything out of his will, any of that sin, separates us from God. He can't, we can't be with him because we have sin. Right? <coughs> Unless what? How can we get rid of our sin? We can. We can ask for forgiveness. And who can we ask? Who can forgive us? Jesus, Jesus you're absolutely right. And when he forgives us of that sin, then that sin is forgiven and gone forever, right? And then we can be with God and have eternal life. And so I brought something with me to show us exactly what this is like. So let, do you know what this glass is? God, right? So this is God. I know you probably thought he was going to look different than you. Yeah. But this is going to represent God. It's not really God, but it's going to represent God, okay? But look, I got something else with me, too. Do you know what these are? What are they? They're cents, quarters, not quarters. They're worth five cents a piece. <coughs> nickels. Nickels, they're nickels. But today they're not going to be nickels because, look, each one of them has a little person on them, right? So we're going to say this is us. All right? And so this is us, and this is God, right? And we want to be with God, don't we? We want to be with God forever in eternity in heaven, right? But there's a problem. Do you see what's on top of God? Sin. And so this sin keeps us from getting to God, doesn't it? Look, if we have God here, and we've got us, and we try to get in. We can't, can we? No. Right? The sin separates us from God, doesn't it? And so what did we say we needed to do? We needed for, for what? Forgiveness. forgiveness. You're exactly right. And who do we ask for forgiveness? Jesus. Jesus, right? Yeah. Because Jesus died on the cross, and so he gave his blood to forgive our sins so that we could no longer be separated by, from God, but have eternal life with God, and that we can get to God. 
And so if we ask for forgiveness and we put Jesus' blood on our lives, then it breaks through that sin, doesn't it? God's blood, or Jesus' blood washes away our sins and allows us to be with God, doesn't it? Right? And so I wanted you guys to know that. Because we know everybody has sin, right? And we know that sin is disobeying God. But the big bad thing about sin is, is that it separates us from God. But Jesus died on the cross so that we can have forgiveness and we can no longer be separated but have eternal life with God. Okay? All right, let's have the pastor pray for us. Father, we are so thankful for the blood of Jesus. He was willing to go to the cross and die for us that we might be forgiven of our sins. If there is anyone here today, God, that is separated from you because of their sin, I pray this would be the day that you might speak to their heart. They'd come to you and be saved. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen.
to me from above if I could count all the blessings from the storehouse of love I'd simply ask for a favor of him beyond mortal end 
I'm sure he would run it again. I want to stroll over heaven with you some glad day when all our troubles and heart exceptionally vanished away. We're Where all things are new, I want to stroll over heaven with you. So many places of beauty we've longed to see here below, but time and treasures are making. Let me start again on that verse. So many places of beauty we belong to see here below. But time and treasures have kept us from making plans, as you know. But come the morning of rapture, together we'll stand. While I stroll over heaven with you, I want to stroll over heaven with you some glad day when all our troubles and heart exceptionally vanished away. Then we'll enjoy the beauty where all things are new. I want to stroll over heaven with you. We'll renew old acquaintance with the friends we once knew. Then we'll meet all our loved ones and meet Jesus too. That will be a glad reunion and there'll be much to view while I stroll over heaven with you. I want to stroll over heaven with you some glad day with all our troubles and heart exceptionally vanished away then we'll enjoy the beauty where all things are new i want to stroll over heaven with you a year ago I sung that song, standing over top of my mother's casket. My husband didn't think I could do it, but I told him I had to because I stood and sang at my father's funeral. It takes a lot of courage to stand up and sing over a loved one, but with God's help, I was able to do it, and I know she's proud of me today.
God's children are leaving one by one, passing this way and going home. Signs of the times reveal we don't have very long. But each one who stands upon this shore, waving goodbye. to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 5. 2 <clears throat> Corinthians, chapter 5, and we'll begin reading with verse number 6. <clears throat> Therefore, we are always competent, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done, whether it be good or bad. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word today. <clears throat> well, there in verse number six, Paul makes a pretty bold statement uh, when he says we are always confident. And the always is the really <clears throat> bold part. Right? I mean, he doesn't just say we are confident. No, he says we are always confident. Always means always, as in all the time. As in there's never a time when we are not confident. Pretty bold, right? You ever met somebody like that? You ever know somebody who was that way? who always seem to be so sure of themselves, completely certain about uh, just things in general. What would you think about them? Do they ever get on your nerves? Do they ever seem irritating? Do you ever just want to smack them? <laughs> and say, how can you possibly be this way? How can you always be confident when the rest of us are out here struggling with all of these doubts, fears, and uncertainties? What is it that you know that I don't know? Or what is it that you have that I don't have? It would be kind of difficult. Well, I want us to look at this today, and I want us to try to understand exactly what Paul meant, and exactly what he was talking about when he said we are always confident. 
Now the first thing we need to realize, pretty important thing, is that he was not saying that we are always confident about everything. Okay? We know this from other passages in the Bible that show us there were times when Paul wasn't confident at all. These other passages show us that he actually was human like the rest of us and not some kind of superhuman. He had his moments also. He really did. He said that he was pressed out of measure, above his strength, so much so that he even despaired of life. So he had his moments. He did. So he's not saying we are always confident about everything. He is saying we are always confident about one thing in particular, about a specific thing. So what was that thing? Well, before he says we are always confident, he says, therefore. You see that in verse 6? He says, therefore... We are always confident. And any time that you come across the word therefore in the Bible, you need to stop, back up, and see what it's there for. Not a reaction of any kind. I thought that'd go over good. Well, in this case, you have to back up to verse number one. In verse number one, you find a four. Not a therefore, but a four. In verse 1, Paul says, for we know, not we think, not we hope, not even we believe. No, he says, for we know. And so the for in verse number 1 is what the therefore in verse number 6 is there for. Again, little to no reaction. So let's see what it was. What was this one thing that Paul was always confident about? Let's read verse 1. He says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That's what he was always confident about. So what is it? Well, he's talking about his earthly house. He's not talking about the physical residence, the physical building that he lived in. Now he's talking about his physical body, this earthly house. And he says, I know that when this physical body dies, when it is dissolved, when it disappears, when it goes away, when it returns to the dust from which it came, I know that ain't the end to me. He says, I know I'm not going to dissolve. I'm not going to disappear. I'm not going to cease to exist. He said, in fact, when that happens, when that day comes, that just means it's time for me to move. (laughs) That's moving day. He says, because I have a building of God. It's not made by human hands. In other words, I'm moving from this body into my new body. One that God has prepared for me, whose builder and maker is God. That's such a good thing to be confident about, right? He's saying, I know what's going to happen to me when I die. I know where I'm going when I leave this world. He goes on and he talks about this body and he says, it's eternal. So it's not like this earthly house. Because this earthly house, this physical body that you and I are in right now, it is very, very temporary. In fact, Paul says it's like a a tent. He says this earthly house of this tabernacle. A tabernacle was a tent. And we all know that tents are not meant to be lived in on a permanent basis. Not not even close. In fact, they're not meant to be dwelt in on a long-term basis either. Just for a little while. Like when you go camping on the weekend with your family. And you spend a couple of nights in that tent. It's just for a little while. But Paul says this earthly house may be very temporary. Oh, but my building of God, my new body, it's eternal. It's never going to dissolve. 
It's never going to go away. It will live on forever and ever and ever. And not only is it eternal, he says, but he says it's eternal in the heavens. <laughs> so he says, when I move, I'm not just moving from this frail tent into my new eternal body. He says, when I die, I'm leaving this sinful, fallen world. And I'm going home. I'm going to heaven to be with God. This is what Paul was always confident about. His eternal destiny. He said, I know what's going to happen when I die. I know where I'll be. I know where I'm going when I leave this world. And folks, we need to have the very same type of confidence about our eternal destiny. We need to have the same assurance about what will happen to us and where we'll be that Paul had. Because the truth is, we're all going to die. Amen. Now I know that's not a pleasant thought. It may seem like a gloomy thing, but I'm here to tell you today that it is the absolute truth. We are all going to die. Should the Lord tarry his coming, these earthly houses, they're going to dissolve. They will return to the dust from which they came. And so we need to have confidence that when that time comes, we know what's going to happen to us. We know where we'll be. We'll know where we're going. Do you have confidence about your eternal destiny? We need to. Okay, so how can we have the same kind of confidence that Paul did, that we could stand up and say, I am always confident. I am absolutely certain about my eternal destiny. Well, he said there's some other things that we have to know that will give us that confidence. If you look there in verse 6 again, he says, therefore we are always confident knowing that. So he's about to talk about some things that because we know these things, we have this confidence. So let's see what they are. The first thing we need to know is our presence. Again, in verse 6, he says, Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. First question I have for you today. Do you feel at home in your body? Do you feel comfortable in your own skin? Like this is your presence. This is where I am, and this is where I'm supposed to be. This is where I belong. There are some people who seem to think that that's the ultimate goal in life. To get to the point where you feel that way. Where you feel completely at home and comfortable in your body. And just like our houses that we live in, we work on them, we fix them up, we may even remodel them from time to time. We're doing that in an effort to feel at home there to make them more and more comfortable for us. Likewise, people do the same thing with their physical bodies. They work on them. They exercise and they try to eat right and they take care of themselves. And it's all in an effort to finally get to the place where I feel at home in my body. Now, there's nothing wrong with taking care of your body. We should do that, at least to a certain extent. I mean, they are the temple of the Holy Spirit, after all. But look at what Paul's saying here. He says, while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. So if I feel at home in this earthly house, in this physical body, I am away from the Lord. I am not with Him. At least not like I should be. And not like He wants me to be. And I love the, that Paul uses this phrase, at home. At home in the body. Because I think that really gets to what he's talking about. Because they say that home is where the heart is. You ever heard that? So where is your heart today? Is it here in your body? 
Where are your affections? Are they set on things below? Or are they set on things above? What is it that you truly want? What is it that you really desire? Uh, where is your heart today? What is it that you love? Is it physical pleasures? Material wealth? Worldly fame? Or is it spiritual things? The things of God. It's the old spirit versus the flesh thing again. It keeps coming up all the time, right? And that's because they're at war with each other. They are striving against each other. They are contending for control of our lives. They never seem to work together. They never cooperate. And so we decide who wins. We decide who comes out on top. Paul put it this way over in the book of Romans. He said, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, they mind the things. So this whole question of your presence, where are you, where do you belong, it really is a matter of what you're after. What are you after? What are you truly looking for? What are you seeking? What are you pursuing? What is it that you're trying to gain? What is it that you really want to have? Is it those fleshly things that we talked about? Physical pleasures, material wealth? All of that, if it is, then Paul said, you'll mind those things. That's what will be on your mind. That's what you'll think about. That's what you'll focus on. That's where you'll put your concentration. And not only that, but you'll do what it takes to have those things. When he says you'll mind them, he says you'll obey them so that you can have them. But if we're after the Spirit, then that's what we'll have on our minds. That's what we'll be thinking of. That's what we'll be focusing on. I want the spiritual things, the things of God. Where's your presence today? Where do you feel at home? In the body or with the Lord? That's the first thing we need to know. Second thing he talked about that we need to know is our perspective. Verse 7. He says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Amen. What you have here in verse 7 is a parenthetical statement. And that's a fancy word just to say that it's got parentheses around it. You notice that? It starts with a left parentheses and it ends with a right parentheses. And so those parentheses are meant to be there. I have told you before that I believe that the word of God is fully inspired. And that means that not only are its words, its thoughts, its ideas, its principles, and its precepts inspired, but I believe the punctuation is inspired. God's word is inerrant, infallible, and inspired. It is God-breathed, and I believe that includes the punctuation. So what you have here are divinely inspired parentheses. God breathed parentheses. Have you ever seen divinely inspired parentheses? Well, now you have. The thing about parenthetical statements is that they are usually meant as an aside. In other words, the speaker's going along and he's talking about his subject. He's saying all these different things and then all of a sudden he kind of stops and inserts this. He's talking about this and this and that. But then he says, oh, by the way, there's this too. So let me slide this in. I want you to know this morning that this particular parenthetical statement is in no way just an aside. This is far more than Paul saying, oh, by the way, there's this too. Because this parenthetical statement is absolutely crucial to our confidence in our eternal destiny. Because think about what he's saying in these parentheses. He says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Pretty important, don't you think? Yeah, because those are our only two choices. You're 
either going to walk by faith or you're going to walk by sight. You, you may be going by what you can see. And I, I tell you, you need to check on your sight-walking friends these days. Because what we see, what can be seen, what we see taking place and going on in this world right now is not good. It is horrible. We see so much misery. And so those who are walking by sight today, they must be miserable also. I don't see how they can't be. But Paul says, we don't do that. He says, we don't go by what we can see with our physical eyes. He says, no, we walk by faith. We're going to go by the substance of things hoped for. We're going to go by the evidence of things not seen. Amen. So walking by faith means you got to look up and not look down. It means you got to look to God and not the government, not to man and not even to yourself. It means looking up for your redemption draweth nigh. Looking for the source of our redemption. It means looking to the hills from whence cometh our help. Not down. And oh, it means looking beyond as well. We've got to be able to look past our current circumstances. Look past our present situation. All of the strife and all of the heartache and all of the disappointment that we're dealing with now. We've got to be able to look beyond all of that to the glory that awaits us in eternity. Right. That's walking by faith. Walking by faith means that we are sustained and guided by our belief in God. Amen. Sustained. Held up. Kept, preserved by our belief in God. We are guided, we are directed, we make our choices and our decisions by our belief in God. Our belief that He's working all things together for our good. Right. Romans 8, 28, you remember? Yes. That He somehow, some way, in His Great omnipotence. In his all-knowing omniscience, he's taken all of this stuff, even those bad, miserable things that we see going on around us today, he's taken all of them and he's working them together for our good. He's putting them into place like pieces in a giant supernatural jigsaw puzzle that will ultimately be for our benefit. Faith tells us that. Our faith also tells us that he will perform the good work that he has begun in us until the day of Jesus Christ. And it is a good work because he started it. He began it. It's his work. And everything that God does is good. Amen. So it's a good work. God doesn't do bad things. And we have the assurance that what he has started He's going to finish. Amen. Folks, I've got good news for you this morning. God always, always, always finishes what he starts. Amen. There is not one thing that he has started that has been left undone. Can you think of anything that God started that is incomplete? Because there's not. He always finishes what he starts. And so that means... This work that he's performing in me and that he's performing in you, it's his responsibility. It's up to him to see that it gets done, not us. We just have to cooperate. We just have to trust him and obey him. And he will perform it. He will complete it in our lives. So he's not just the author of our faith. He's the finisher of our faith as well. So this story that he began before we were even born, while we were still in our mother's womb, he will see to it that the final chapter is written. He'll finish it. Our faith tells us that. Our faith also reminds us that Jesus promised that he would never leave us comfortless. He said, I'll never leave you alone. 
I'm not going to leave you all by yourself to face this world. He said, I will come to you. I will, not I might, not I could. He said, I will come to you. Amen. And I believe with all my heart that he was talking about here and now as well as in the future. He will come to us right now. And it doesn't matter where you are. You could be in the darkest place you've ever been in in your life. You could feel like you're in the deepest hole that you've ever known. But all you have to do is call on the name of Jesus. Just cry out to him. And wherever you are, he will come to you. He will comfort us. He will strengthen us. And he will help us. He said, I will come to you. He's talking about right now, here today, but he was also talking about in the future. Because in case you haven't heard, Jesus Christ is coming back. <laughs> He's coming again. And I don't think it's going to be very long. I believe it will be soon. I'm talking about when he comes in the rapture to take his church out of this world. That day will come. When the trumpet's going to sound, Jesus Christ will appear in the eastern sky. The graves of those who are asleep in the Lord, they're going to burst wide open and they're going to rise to meet the Lord first. And then those of us who are alive and remain will be changed. We'll go from our earthly house to our godly house, to that building that he's prepared for us, our new body, our glorified body and we'll be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. He said I will come to you and he is coming again. Are you ready? When the rapture takes place when the trumpet sounds will you be going with him or will you be left behind? The faith also tells us that we can Trust God. We can trust that he's in control. And we really need that right now, don't we? Because I tell you, it seems like everything's out of control. Like this planet has went off its axis. And it's just spinning madly through space now. Like everything is just completely gone crazy. That's why I need to be reminded and I need to be assured that God's in control. That there is a reason for everything that I face. There is a purpose for all that I go through in my life. It's not just random. It's not just fate. God's got a reason for it. There is a purpose behind it all. And that reason, that purpose, is to conform us to the image of His Son. That's what He's working on. That good work that he's performing, he's using all of these things, working them together to make you and me more like Jesus. I told you it was a good work, and it is. So our faith tells us that God is sovereign over everyone and everything. My faith tells me today that he is still on his throne. He always has been, and he always will be. Our faith tells us that his work will be done. His word is going to be fulfilled. And his plan will be completed. Nothing can stop it. Nothing will stop it. Not even a global pandemic. Okay? It seems like COVID has pretty much shut down everything in the world except Walmart. Apparently, Walmart can't be shut down either. But I promise you today that it will not and it cannot shut down God's plan. It is coming to pass. We're seeing it every day. We are actually privileged to get to witness it take place with our own eyes. My friend, it's happening. It is coming to pass. What's our perspective? Walking by faith, or are we walking by sight? Are we looking up or looking down? 
I tell you, there's a lot of people today that are looking for the Antichrist. They're looking for the mark of the beast. God's people don't need to look for the Antichrist. <laughs> we need to be looking for Jesus Christ. That should be our perspective. We need to know that. We need to know our presence. We need to know our perspective. And then Paul says, we also need to know our preference. Verse number 8. He says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather. Almost titled this message that. Willing rather. I like that. Willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Amen. Last question I'm going to ask you today, and I want you to be honest because it's important. Would you rather be here or there? Would you rather be present in your body like you are right now or would you rather be in the presence of Jesus? I can say this. The answer to that question is really easy for me. And it's getting easier every day. I would much rather be there than here. I would much rather be in the presence of my Savior who loves me, who died for me, than I would to be present in this body. Don't get me wrong. I love my family. I love my friends. I love spending time with them. Oh, but I'm willing rather to be with Jesus. And I really believe that ought to be the preference of every born-again child of God. Anybody who's truly saved, that ought to be their choice today when asked. You ought to say, yeah, I'd rather be there than I would to be here. If that's not how you feel, if that wouldn't be your preference, that's a cause for concern. It really is. Are you always confident about your eternal destiny? Are you absolutely certain that when your earthly house dissolves, when it goes away, that you'll be moving into a building of God, that you've got a new body, a glorified body waiting for you that is eternal in the heavens? Do you know where you're going, my friend? Do you know what's going to happen when you die? Father, we come to you today happy, joyful, glad to be able to say, as the great apostle did, we are always confident about our eternal destiny. Because we know these other things that are so important. We need to know our presence. We need to know where our heart is. What is it that we truly love? We need to know our perspective. Are we walking by faith? Or are we walking by sight? And Lord, we definitely need to know our preference. We'd rather be here or there with you. Oh, I'd much rather be there with you, God. I look forward to the day that I will be. Oh, how I long to hear that trumpet sound. Jesus, you said that you would come to us, and I believe with all my heart that you are. But there may be someone here today that doesn't have that confidence, Lord. Doesn't have that blessed assurance that when you come, they'll be going with you. They don't know that they have a heavenly body to look forward to that they're going to move into someday. Lord, would you speak to those hearts right now? Would you help them to realize how important this is, that this is eternity that we're dealing with here this morning? It's not just the next 10 minutes, but it could be forever and ever. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would move upon this congregation today, would move upon our hearts. Lord, help us to see where we stand, help us to see where we are, and may we do whatever is needed, Lord, to have that confidence, to be able to say, I am always confident. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's all awesome.
there's a day just out in front of us I know will surely come that eastern sky will open wide revealing God's dear son and I know from here to heaven but the twinkling of an eye and in the midst of all his glory we'll hear the sweetest cry welcome home I give you welcome home you're here for good and look around was it worth the wait? Welcome home. Step through the gate. Before they sing the next verse, I'd like to ask for all heads to be bowed. Every eye to be closed. I want you to know that as your pastor today, I would never want to scare you. But I care more about your eternal destiny than anything else. I really want you to do good in life. I want you to succeed. Have all your dreams come true and all those kind of things. But I'd trade every bit of that to know you're ready to meet Jesus. To know that you're always confident about where you'll be when you leave this world. That's the only thing that truly matters when you get right down to it. Yes. So I wonder this morning, is there somebody here today that would have to say, Preacher, my heart is troubled. I can't deny it. Because I know what's going on inside me right now. I believe God's dealing with me today. I believe what he's telling me is that I need to be saved. That I need to get ready for eternity. Because that could be at any moment, I know. And I don't want to miss out, preacher. I really don't. Would you step out of where you are this morning? And just come up to this altar and bow down on your knees and ask Jesus to come into your life. And he will. He said that all who came to him, he would in no wise cast them out. Basically what he was saying, if you come to me, there is no way I'll turn you away. Would you come to him this morning? Trust in him today to save you, to make you his child, to give you that confidence that you've got a building of God waiting for you. Oh, if you don't have that today, how my heart goes out to you. I want you to have that. If I could get in this altar and do this for you today, I would. But I can't. It has to be your decision. There is nobody looking at you right now except me and God. Will you come? He loves you. He loves you more than anybody does. He sent his son to die in your place. That you would not be separated from him. I think if you take that first step, the rest will fall right in place. Will you trust him this morning? I urge you to. As they sing this next verse, if you know you need to come, don't wait on somebody else. This is your decision. This is between you and God. This is where you're going to spend eternity. Please trust Him today. And I believe at least for me, I'll see my mom and dad, my brothers and my sisters everywhere.
thinking if he'll sing one more verse if you'll have him sing one more verse then God I'll know it's me maybe you're negotiating with the Lord maybe you've asked him that here you go there's a day just out in front of us I know will surely come when that eastern sky It'll open wide, revealing God's dear Son. And I know from here to heaven is but the twinkling of an eye. And in the midst of all His glory, we'll hear the sweetest cry. Welcome home. I hear. shadow of time, I surely would have fallen had not that great hand gripped tight to mine. When the suffering and pain was so great, he never let go. I've got to be special to him for him to hold on so. As he hung on that cross, so great, I'm sure was his pain, that he hung there in silence, not for his, but for my pain. I've never asked, see, I've asked for healing and suffering to him. But I'll keep holding to him, for Satan I won't bend. When this trial then is over, I'll understand 
But until then, I'll just grip tighter to that great thing. Amen. 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 And I thought, you know, what a testimony that that woman had. Yes. Amen. Our hearts and minds clear. Amen. 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 I had to come to church today. Amen. 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 I love you. And as your pastor, I promise to preach the truth to you. Amen. Amen. No matter how much it hurts your feelings. That's right. Because I care about you that much. I hope you know that. Amen. God bless you. Have a good holiday. Hope to see you Wednesday night.